Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on the partner stage. I'm delighted to welcome you to a session from our content partner Coursera, which is titled Staying Globally Competitive with Continued Education and Blended Learning. So our speakers today are Mario Chamorro, Coursera's Head of Latin America, he is responsible for developing data-driven strategies to bring education to more than 12 million learners in the region. And joining him is Francisco Ferrero, who is the head of Casera for Campus in Latin America. Over to you, Mario and Francisco. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is um, a very special day uh, to be sharing with you uh some of the few learnings that we have had in Coursera my colleague and co-worker uh, Francisco uh, will be also presenting today with us um, I'm going to start sharing a presentation that we created but in the meantime Francisco if you want to introduce yourself thank you Mario well, pretty uh, happy to be here thank you for having us and uh we will spend uh the next hour just as Maria said, sharing some of the learnings and some of the experiences we have had during the last um, couple of months, uh, particularly during this uh, COVID-19. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Francisco. Okay, so uh, again, so we're gonna start. Uh, um, my name is Mario Chamorro. I, I am currently the head of uh, Latin America at Coursera. I'm currently based in Mountain View, California but I haven't been always here. So this is my hometown. It's called Pasto in, Col uh, in Colombia. Uh, Pasto is a small town uh, located in the Southwest of Colombia in the border with Ecuador. And uh, yes, I grew up in, uh, uh, next to an active volcano as you can see it on this uh, picture. But uh, some commonality that most of the regional cities that Latin America has is uh, sometimes is the lack of opportunities. So the lack of opportunity brought me to, to explore a career uh, that ended up bringing me to Bogota and then to the United States where I've been living over the past 15 years. Um, something that helped me a lot uh, was education. And basically I really promised myself that I was always going to fight to open up new opportunities for people uh, in Latin America. And um, most of the opportunities, again, in this, this small town were related to agriculture and commodities. And um, the world has changed and we need to also like to open up opportunities for more uh, to stay globally competitive, which is the, the title of this presentation. But uh, I'm also like mentioning Pasto because uh, my city was the one who brought me to Coursera. And I want to start uh, my presentation with this story. Basically, uh, almost four years ago, I was between going to uh, one of the biggest companies here in Silicon Valley and Coursera. So before I made my final decision, I went to visit my parents in Pasto. And I ended up striking a conversation with a young man. He was 22 years old. And uh, out of the blue, I told him that I was trying to decide if I was going to uh, this company uh, in Silicon Valley or to Coursera and he turned out to me and he said wait did you say Coursera well thanks to Coursera I, I learned how to code and thanks to that particular skill that I learned I'm able to help my mother to pay rent and I'm also contributing with my little brother high school so in that moment I got my answer and um, I decided of course to join Coursera where I've been working over the past four years my first week at Coursera, I had a conversation with uh, Daphne Kohler, which is one of the co-founders of Coursera, and I asked her, what is the good advice for, um, for, uh, for my very first month at Coursera? And she suggested me to find my own North Star. That you can see there is the main hall of Coursera, where we have written uh, the mission of Coursera. And I believe the mission of Coursera is something that uh, we all share in this particular panel which is to bring uh, education to anyone, anywhere, and to transform lives, lives by accessing the world's best uh, learning experience. So uh, I found my North Star in that particular mission. And uh, when I say uh, anyone, anywhere, I focus my attention in Latin America. So that's where I found my North Star, and this is where I've been doing over the past three years and a half. 
Latin America is currently going through very difficult times because of COVID. Our economy has been slowing down. According to the World Bank, there's going to be a GDP contraction of 72% this year and more than 53% of uh, our people in Latin America are working in informal settings, which means uh, unemployment rates have been skyrocketing. And also in terms of COVID, uh, it's one of the regions that have been more severely affected by, by COVID. So there's a lot of work to do. And in this uh, particular moment, Latin America needs us um, the most. Okay, so now I'm gonna, um, switch to a little agenda about how it's gonna go, uh, how is uh, Francisco and my presentation is gonna go. So first we're gonna be sharing some of the recent experiences that we have been learning at Coursera from COVID. Uh, the second one is uh, some of the initiatives that we have been doing particularly in the region. Then we're gonna move a little bit to say, uh, to talk about Coursera and the work that we have been particularly doing in Latin America. After that, Francisco is gonna Mention some of the efforts on uh, on Coursera for Campus and like this uh, great opportunity. And finally, we're going to open up for discussion. So uh, this will take us uh, between 20 to 25 minutes or so. So if you're there, thank you for being here with us. Uh, thank you for joining us in this panel. And um, and let's go with it. Okay. So again, little recap. So I come from a small town that has the same characteristics of uh, most of the Latin American cities, which is there are some lack of opportunities. Most of us are also devoted into commodities, into agro. So new opportunities have to be open. And a key tool for that is education. So uh, this is the impact of COVID in, in education. So according to UNESCO, 1.1 billion learners haven't been able to return to schools. And um, as you can see here, the map is basically the universities that have been closing uh, their doors uh, because of COVID. So as a result, one out of uh, one in five high school seniors believe they are likely not to attend college next um, term, the next semester because of the COVID outbreak. And um, this period of time is uh, definitely something that require organizations, universities um, and companies and individuals to adapt, to improvise and to keep moving forward. Um, so in, at Coursera, we have been seeing um, a strong growth, which is kind of like a bittersweet flavor, but at the same time, it's a clear, um, it, 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 it's a clear um, sentiment of, um, of how online education has been rapidly growing. And in Latin America actually is the, is the same story. So um, if you compare our growth um, of uh, April with uh, April from last year, we're growing at 60-100%. Uh, in Latin America, it's also like it's the same case. We, over the past uh, quarter, um, the second quarter of 2020, we grew for like 3.3 million only in Latin America. Again, Latin America hasn't been deception. Uh, when you start taking a look of our growth in different regions across the world, Latin America is experiencing the same, which is also interesting to me because um, some of the, I mean, if you compare a year ago with now, uh, there used to be a lot of resistance and now basically uh, online education became a really powerful tool for universities to keep uh, teaching. So uh, the adoption has been uh, definitely, um, moving fast. So um, when, when COVID arrived, uh, Coursera uh, decided to, to create a few initiatives. So uh, for the matter of this panel, I'm going to share two initiatives that Coursera started. So the first one was the Coursera for Campus uh, Response Initiative, which is the one that Francisco is leading right now in Latin America. And basically, uh, if you remember the numbers that we were showing about UNESCO, um, where 92% of universities in the world had to close their doors, we say we need to help the universities. So um, the first experience that we had was with Wuhan University, which was one of the very first ones who experienced uh, the, um, their, their closure because of COVID. So Wuhan University had a partnership with Duke University, and Duke University is one of the partners of Coursera. So um, Duke University asked Coursera to provide Coursera for Campus to Wuhan. And 
it ended up working pretty well. And then COVID expanded around the world. So we decided just to offer this platform of Coursera for Campus totally for free for universities. So since March 12th, Coursera began offering um, this platform for free for universities. And these are some of the early results. So we had a tremendous positive response from universities, a tremendous positive response from students. Um, so just in Latin America, as of today, uh, 686 universities are part of this program and almost 100,000 students have been benefited from this program. Only in Latin America, uh, the other numbers are globally, which is uh, 9,000 uh, universities are using this program and 1.2 million students are benefited from this. So as you can see here, also we have to include some of the logos of the universities that are currently being part of this program of the Coursera for Campus COVID uh, response, which Francisco is gonna uh, dive a little bit more uh in the next slides the second initiative that we created was the workforce recovery initiative so again the first wave that we saw during COVID was the universities closing their their doors so we created the Coursera for campus for free the second one is uh, it was the um, tremendous impact of the of unemployment so only here in the us we saw 40 million people applying for unemployment insurance and then we start of course seeing the same trend across the world so we say how can we help governments to fight unemployment so that's how we ended up creating the workforce recovery initiative that was launched on april 24th um we launched that with also with a, a lot of like uh, presidents from latin america have joined us in this initiative so president ivan duque from colombia or president uh Matelli from guatemala and as of today, 92% of uh, countries in Latin America are currently using this uh, workforce recovery initiative where the government agencies are offering Coursera for free to fight unemployment um, in these particular regions. The final story that I would share right now is again, we start speaking about like the impact of COVID in universities and governments. And also on top of that, the world is moving extremely fast right now technology has been changing the way how we interact with each other and therefore automatization has been displacing millions of jobs so um 42 percent of jobs are expected to to have entirely different skill set by 2022 in fact um i was able to join the world economic forum at davos uh, at the beginning of this year and uh, this is uh, sadia sahiri where for the world economic for 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 first time they mention uh like the reskilling revolution as um as an emergency it's not a nice to have but it's an emergency which means again technology is moving super fast human adaptability is not moving as fast as, uh, as technology so a reskilling is needed in order to in, in order to skill people to don't be affected by automatization um so um, with Coursera, we were in Davos and uh, where we joined like different organizations and governments. And uh, we launched um, with the World Bank this initiative where Coursera with uh, other companies such as PricewaterhouseCoopers, Ninth Power, Salesforce, the governments of Russia, India, Mexico, uh, launched this initiative to call the reskilling revolution to reskill 1 billion people uh, on this decade. So again, Coursera is really committed with um, the reskilling revolution. And now, now during COVID time, I think kind of like the whole uh, reskilling revolution has been uh, accelerated. So these are some of the future jobs. I mean, when I graduated from uh, actually from my master's degree in 2006 at Columbia University, uh, jobs such as a social media manager didn't exist. Uh, and therefore, a lot of like these new jobs that you can see here are not existing. Some of them, they do um but definitely we need to prepare our students and our learners for this new economy um so francisco how do you see the next uh, academic year thank you mario just a couple of comments in terms of some learnings we have had for the future first and foremost delivering education remains the core and reflecting truly global university mindset will be a core theme with some uncertainty regarding first overseas student trends. We already uh, are experiencing that. Second, right ecosystem in preparation for the new demands at the labor market. And third, 
managing high standards toward academic integrity and learning outcome. So think first about your learning experience. Uh, future academic intake, semester, enrollments, planning is expected to evolve over a period of time. So building resilience for our organization is key and it's probably one of the main learners that we will all have as persons, as organization uh, after this COVID-19. So back to you, Mario, so you can talk about the Coursera ecosystem. Thank you. Sally, how are we doing? All good. Okay, I saw her smiling, so I think we're fine. Whew. <laughs> Great. Um, so again, the title of this uh, presentation is uh, Staying Globally Competitive. And we were describing how the world has been crazy, uh, changing uh, from COVID, uh, from technology, uh, and they, therefore what is needed in order to, to face this new world. And we believe that Flink Coursera could be a, a great partner during this rapid change. So now I'm just going to describe you a little bit about like the Coursera ecosystem. So to understand Coursera is super easy. You just have to understand uh, these three key factors. The first one and the main reason because we're here and the main reason that uh, I wake up every day uh, with a huge smile ready to help and to work is our learners. Right now, Coursera has 64 mil million learners. So th thanks to that, we are the largest uh, higher education online platform in the world. But our learner, they come to our educators. So that's why we partner with 165 of the best universities in the world uh, and with 40 industry partners. They create uh, different type of courses, specializations and degrees uh, on the educator side. So the learner comes to the educator to learn and also like to get a certificate that validates also his or her learning. And then they come to the third part, which is the employer. On the employer side, which is our B2B side, um, Coursera works with uh, companies, with governments, and also with universities, providing the personalized platform for private companies to reskill, cross-skill, and upskill their employees, for governments to do the same, but with their citizens or their employees, and with universities for their learners. So again, this is the Coursera ecosystem, and Coursera is in the middle of, of the learner, the educator, and the employer. Our main goal is to bring the best learning experience, but also like to help transform lives. And the key transformation happens at the end. So now let me move to from the world to Latin America, which Latin America has been again also like experiencing a tremendous growth. So to give you one example, so when I started at Coursera, only three years and a half, we had 2.2 million learners. Only in three years and a half, now we have 12 million learners. And we have 15 university partners and our enterprise business is also growing very fast. Some of the, uh, I mean, of our five uh, countries in Latin America in terms of students of uh, unique learners are Mexico is the first one, uh, then followed up by Brazil, Colombia, Chile, and Peru. And also Mexico is the, is the third uh, largest country in terms of uh, learners at Coursera. And Brazil is the number fifth uh, in, I mean, Coursera globally. So definitely Latin America represents um, a tremendous um, part of, of Coursera and a lot of priorities for, for us. And this is the network of uh, Coursera. Again, Coursera partners with universities. Coursera is not trying to replace universities. On totally the opposite, Colombia, uh, Coursera tries to partner with, with universities and to bring the best uh, technology and the best uh, experiences to work together to, towards um, our learners. Here are our learners, uh, our university partners in, in Latin America and Spain. Why Spain? Because uh, Spain also creates uh, a lot of uh, courses in, in Spanish. And uh, so these are our partners in, across the region. Again, we have uh, Austral and Universidad Palermo in Argentina, Católica de Chile and Universidad Chile in Chile, Universidad de los Andes in Colombia, and in Mexico, um, UAM, UNAM, and Tecnológico de Monterrey in Brazil. Also, we have a, a, like six partners. So definitely, um, we are uh, have a really, really uh, interesting footprint in, in the region, and we're working really hard with these universities. 
Uh, so just again, just to understand Coursera. So we Coursera, we started with MOOCs or so uh, Massive Open Online Courses. Then we move into specializations, which is, uh, we call this the stackable model. Uh, again, the specializations is uh, two or three, no, sorry, three or four courses of the same, um, of the same topic that uh, bring the learner for more and deeper um, knowledge. Then we also started with certificates that are created by industry partners such as Google and uh, certificates help uh, are really um, focus on work skills. And the last one is degrees. So we have a master's degrees. Uh, for instance, we have a master's degree in science with the uh, University of Michigan, a master's of computer science with UPenn. Uh, in Latin America, we have two masters um, in Spanish one in computer science and one in data science and projects which is uh the very the very first one uh, is, is, is a very new one that we recently started called guide, guided projects which is on the uh, projects of two hours that are uh devoted to be learning by doing um so uh in terms of co the type of content that coursera has uh basically the three largest uh topics are business technology and data science also, arts and humanities play a really important role. Interestingly, uh, during COVID, uh, the um, self-development courses have been highly, highly popular as well. So this is something interesting. So we do have a course called uh, The Science of Wellbeing from Yale, and that has more than 1.3 million learners only in 2020. This is in terms of uh, content that we only have in Spanish uh, that I wanted to share for the matter of this presentation in Latin America. We have almost 500 courses. And as I mentioned, we have two master's degrees from Universidad de Los Andes, which a beautiful story that, uh, that I shared, like a very quick story is uh, my dream when I was in Pasto, the very, the, the, my hometown was to study at Los Andes, but uh, I didn't have the money my, and, uh, and, and I didn't have also um, the right uh, like the test scores to, uh, to apply for this university. So um, I couldn't make my dream happen. But uh, 20 years later, I joined Coursera and I started working with Los Andes. And uh, when we launched this degree, I told um, the, the provost of Los Andes that uh, my best revenge was to go back to Los Andes and to help them to create their very first degree, online degree. And, uh, and, uh, and we were having a good laugh about it and, uh, and a good time. Um, so, okay, so, and this is the very final part. We're working with, as I mentioned, with uh, different organizations, uh, helping them to upskill, reskill, and, and cross-skill their, their employees. So now I'm just gonna hand it to Francisco again, uh, staying globally connected uh, by helping Latin America on different fronts from COVID, from reskilling revolution, and from the ecosystem of Coursera with 12 million learners, 15 university partners, and more than 200 companies and governments only in Latin America that are currently uh, working with Coursera on, on on bringing the best education to the region that we love. Francisco. Fantastic, Mario. Thank you. In one sentence, what Coursera for Campus provides, it's high quality content and authoring tools for any university in the world. So now a few things uh, here that are the key of the Coursera offering. First, top quality content that Mario described. It can be mapped to your curriculum as a university for credit. It can be built into the classes as a textbook. And I will give you an example in the next slide. Um, many universities don't have faculty to teach A, B, or C. That won't stop students from learning these concepts. And let me give you an example, an example here. Uh, leading university business school in Argentina uh, with one of the best MBAs of the region is implementing artificial intelligence and machine learning programs with labs without the need of a large investment in infrastructure and new faculty. This is happening as we speak. Um, second and third, faculty more than ever need to reimagine seminars, making improvements to how they teach online. A two-hour lecture might actually consist of multiple activities rather than a continuous monolithic video. So authoring tools and guided projects are a key part of this uh, value proposition. Uh, within the ADN of Coursera is the development of job-ready skills 
We use um, essential skills map for that. I will show you this in a minute. The end result is, um, in addition to the knowledge acquisition per se, it's to achieve better jobs, uh, better professionals, and higher admin rates to our master's degrees. Uh, we see a few use cases. Um, first, blended for credit. And a good example uh, of this is in Universidad Nacional de Colombia that is uh, having a geographic information system, a GIS course from University of California, Davis, attached as part of a classroom course in their geology program. Um, other use case, it's standalone for credit as a substitute of a course or a group of courses, what we call a specialization here at Coursera. It might include or not an on-campus assessment. Some countries in Latin America requires it. And some use it as another learning avenue. Um, some universities also offer you know, preparation courses to get into a new career or as a graduation uh, prerequisite based on Coursera. Right now, we have a couple of universities using uh, four credit uh, during um, summer. Uh, next, please. Um, here, uh, next, please, Mario. Uh, here is one example of the learner view from a university that is running a reskilling strategy for their faculty during COVID-19, in addition to the program for students and faculty. They made a fantastic work uh, creating content collections for their learners, including content in different languages, which is interesting. Yeah, according to many uh, rectors and faculty in the region, the fact that an important percentage of the content is delivered in a different language, it is being uh, seen as a barrier, but also as an opportunity for immersive learning in a bilingual environment, you know, adding uh, to the internationalization of their students. And um, here uh, is an example of providing the, rate, the right data points to the faculty. Our learning platform captures a lot of learning behavioral data so we can tell a lot about how the learners are doing. For example, are they high risk of dropping off? Uh, this predictive insights really help faculty to focus their attention on the right group of learners uh, rather than spreading themselves equally across all students. It also delivers learner in need uh, additional automatic uh, support. And um, so let's, uh, let's review a couple of, of use cases in, in the region. Uh, first, um, here uh, there are some quotes from uh, faculty of Universidad Nacional de Colombia, uh, which as you might know, is a leading public institution in Latin America. And they have managed to integrate Coursera courses for credit. Uh, faculty is allowed to use up to 25% of Coursera courses on their programs. And you can see here the usage as of yesterday. They had almost 20,000 enrollments in, I think is that lasted for the last four weeks or five weeks. So it's really impressive. They have uh, several campuses throughout the country, uh, with, uh, which is a fantastic opportunity to use modular and, and stackable uh, content as we call it. And uh, the other um, university that is interesting to review is Universidad Autónoma de Baja California, one of the top public universities in Mexico with long experience and knowledge on online learning. They are using Coursera for campus uh, to provide credits during this summer uh, for their engineering program and also for their faculty and also other programs like chemistry and what they call licenciatura. So it's pretty interesting to see them uh, using uh, that for credit during summer. So now let's, let's take a look to the um, competency-based approach uh, for learners that I talked about before. Um, as Mario mentioned, we partnered with more than 40 leading companies. Companies are becoming educators now. They are creating content for teaching new applicable skills and also for you know, developing an ecosystem um, strategy. So we recently announced uh, Facebook and Alibaba Cloud as new partners. So 
we'll have very interesting content from them in the online marketing and, and uh, cloud computing space. So if we review here, this is the essential skills map I was referring to before. So Coursera's unique data on skills and, data and, and roles allow us to generate an essential skills map for the private sector, um, which shows the top skills in different business functions are you seeing right now. So our recommendation are based on a lot of analysis of what skills each function in your organization should be learning to digitally transform, for instance. Here are uh, what are trending skills in each function. So some companies come to us with pre-built competency maps and as um, understanding of what their employers, employ, employees need to learn. Uh, but many companies don't have this. So, and uh, for those who have it, it's a huge challenge keeping them updated. So we have built an essential skills map for companies that want to match core trend skills to roles and function. This is the same approach we can use to your um, faculty, your students, and, and, and different uh, university. Um, next, please. Uh, once you have an idea of the type of skills you want to develop, you can start to see how our content might transform those skills. And here is a snapshot of our business catalog from the best universities, the best uh, business schools in the world, and how those skills are mapped with the specific uh, content partners. So, and, uh, and here is a, is a map on the technology space, matching skills to partners. We all know that if we want to provide skills on say cloud computing space, Google, Amazon, LearnQuest are among the best partners to go and so on. So in summary, um, we see ourselves as a strategic complement to be used, uh, next, to be used in unison with higher education programs. So really we can help prepare students to the new demanding uh, labor market. So let's talk about the opportunity. This is the impact that institutions we work with are seeing. With Coursera, your ROI is measurable. You can improve the competitive of your university, boosting enrollments and revenue by increasing brand equity and university rankings, as a previous panel in this event talked before. Uh, and this leads to more students and more enrollments. So you then reduce the cost of delivering education by saving faculty time on intro courses and prerequisites and uh, can be re redeploy uh, faculty for research, for instance. So uh, a use case that we're seeing is teachers in different universities, they don't really like to go to the basic uh, MATLAB courses because it's basic, it's not really challenging in terms of talent. So they let Coursera uh, provide those courses for their learners. And, uh, and it's an interesting use of their research talent in a different program or app in the, um, you know, the learning journey in, in different programs. Um, so next please, uh, how do we see the future of education? First, uh, blended will become the new norm. Uh, both the students and teachers will be on and off campus. And according to uh, an, an April 2020 study online and blended instruction produced similar student learning outcomes as traditional in-person instructions at lower, at lower cost. We have a case in, uh, in Colombia where the, the university presented results from a similar survey and they were able to demonstrate that their online program had both a higher employability rates and uh, higher compensation uh, in the period of uh, the next uh, year or two after graduation. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, second, that means you must have online content, including courses and uh, fully online degrees. Uh, recently, um, Simpson Scarborough uh, revealed a 2020 survey, it was in April, I think, 15% of college students uh, who when, uh, when given the option to finish their degree online or complete their degree in person, 
want to finish it online. So this is pretty interesting as well. Um, every university will build, buy, or augment online content, that's for sure. Um, and data will make learning more personalized and more effective. Uh, third, with unemployment soaring, job re uh, relevant education will be a must. According to a recent Gallup uh, survey, only 34% of US college students feel they have the knowledge and the skills needed for the workforce. So I ask you, the audience, what is the other 66% feeling? Uh, this will become mission critical. Uh, students will become skill-based, uh, hands-on learning that comes from university and industry as well. And four, once you start online, there's a pressure on tuition. And you know, uh, we all know that universities are expen spending a lot of money, you know, building infrastructure and uh, getting ready for, for the new challenges. So people will not want to pay as much uh, if not on campus. According to uh, an arts and science group data from April 2020, 67% of students would expect to pay much less in tuition and fees for online learning options if a campus could be open in the fall. So this is uh, uh, interesting and we wanted to share uh, that. So let me finish with this. Um, if your university still have not signed up for the COVID-19 response initiative from Coursera that Mario described, uh, this is your chance. Clock is ticking, we know, but you can enroll your institution and students before July 31st, and you will have access to the whole catalog of 4,000 courses and more than 400 specializations. Uh, your learners, meaning students, faculty, staff, and even alumni, if you decide so, will have until September to finish their courses and get these certificates for free. After you sign up, uh, send us an email to Mario or to me, and we will invite you to a virtual coffee, what Mario called a cafecito con Coursera. So the team can help you to uh, up to speed uh, the, the onboarding process. And with that, I thank you very much. Muchas gracias and buen día. Let me read some of the questions we, we have. Um, First question is, uh, let's see, can credits for Coursera courses help students to gain a place at the university of their choice? Mario, would you wanna take this one? Sure, so can, just kinda of like to make sure that all of us understood. So can credits, can, can you please repeat? Frank? Yes, sure. Can credits uh, for, uh, for Coursera courses help students sure. to gain a place at the university uh, of their choice? Okay, so when the student finalizes a course at Coursera, the student, uh, the learner gets a certificate from the university and the Coursera. Um, let's put an example on digital marketing by the University of uh, Universidad de Los Andes in Colombia. So Universidad de Los Andes issued this uh, certification, uh, certificate, sorry, of, um, of uh, that Francisco Forero or Sally finished this course in, uh, in, in digital marketing. This certificate doesn't have academic credit. Although uh, through this uh, Coursera for Campus uh, initiative, some universities are using uh, Coursera catalog courses to complement uh, their courses by creating this blended model of education. But that mostly depends on the professor or the director of that particular program. Again, because of COVID, a lot of regulation has been impacted. So just to give you a few examples. So in India right now, 40% of uh, the academic credit can be taken online. So that's why universities in India have been using Coursera to provide and to complement their classes and uh, to basically create 40% of their academic credit based on these particular courses. In Colombia, I believe it's, uh, it's around 20%. So some of our universities uh, that are using Coursera for campus 
which is the initiative that Francisco was describing, are using these courses to provide uh, academic credit, but that depends of the professor and depends of the university. Great, Mario, thank you. You will love uh, the next one. Um, some qualifications require practical experience. How can Coursera support study in areas such as biomedical subjects? Okay, so here in Silicon Valley, where I live, uh, companies such as um, like Google, Facebook, Twitter are not requiring uh, a degree to apply for a job. So they are mostly based on competences. Uh, in fact, uh, the president of uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers also he he had he coined this phrase called "skills pays the bills." So basically, a skill relevant to a job, uh, it's basically is the one that they're interested in in getting. So how can Coursera help on that? So we develop uh, certificates, kind of the um, we call it the certs, the certificates uh, that are issued by companies such as Google. Uh, in fact, one particular example is the Google IT certificate that uh, we launched uh, with Google about uh, two years ago. And this is a collection of five courses that takes a student with only bachelor, with only a high school degree uh, to go through these uh, five courses and to get ready for, for the job market. So besides this course, we created a partner alliance with different companies such as Bank of America, Walmart and others here in the US. So for the learners who finish this the certificate, this professional certificate, they were able to get a, a little a step closer to to a job. And uh, thanks to that, uh, actually, it's, a, it's a one of my favorite stories that was featured on Time Magazine about a homeless who completed this course. And thanks to that, uh, he's not a homeless anymore. He has his own uh, apartment and, and pays the rent. So again, we have been very focus on um, on on developing uh, job relevant uh, skills uh, and actually Francisco described some of those in, in his um, in his slide and the other the other part uh, to that question might be um, the practical uh, la um, um, we call um, projects uh, guided projects which gives you or provides the learner with a practical experience, a hands-on experience uh, with a, you know, simultaneous instructor or trainer providing instructions and directions to conduct experiments or uh, any sort of labs. So this is the result of a recent acquisition. Um, so uh, if you remember, Mario described guided projects within the catalog of Coursera. So that's part of the answer uh, to the qualification required uh, for a practical experience. So there's another question. Let me take this one, Mario. When we discuss blended learning, we often tie innovation to technology integration. But rather than asking how technology can enhance learning, two we instead ask what makes an optimum learning environment? Two, we rethink how we see the classroom post-pandemic. Uh, definitely, we think so. What we've seen is, is like two, two components uh, of this infrastructure uh, for an optimum learning environment. First, it's great content. There is great content coming from different universities, institutions, different parts of the world. So we at Coursera were able to partner with top brand universities to provide that content. But that's probably just half of the answer. Because the other half, it's the pedagogy. How we use that content in, uh, in the right way to provide skills to those learners. It's, it's been, you know, this pandemic has uh, made some universities unprepared, um, confused, couple of Zoom conference and three or four YouTube videos with a learning environment, which is clearly not. So we at Coursera have learned from the 64 million learners around the globe on how the best practices around the curriculums, around curriculum integration, about assessments, where it's a good time to include an assessment. What's the right uh, length of, uh, you know, a seminar? Is it four minutes? Is it six minutes? Is it 10? Is it an hour? So we have uh, 
data and stats that show us and, and teach us how to best use that content. So it's two avenues to that um, question. One is content, one is the way of delivering it, and the other, it's the right ecosystem to create content. It's not using pre-built content, but how your classroom, how your institution can create and reuse new content uh, from you know your top professors your or top teachers, uh, of course, has a lot of uh, great content to show and to, and to reuse, maybe in different programs and different courses and different campuses. So that is probably the third um, component of this optimal uh, learning uh, environment. Mario, I don't know if you want to add something to that. No, no, that's pretty much I get it right. Um, Sian, uh, how many people we have, or wh wh where's the audience coming from? Just uh, out of curiosity. Sorry, I can't see where the audience is coming from, but I know that we had um, over a thousand people registered the, to the event. I can't tell you how many people are watching this particular session, but wow. we, we, yeah, but for the whole event. But um, yeah, well, we, we have two stages running at the moment. So you've got another 10 minutes. So if you wanted to ask any more questions, I can see that there are a couple more that have come through. Um, sure. Feel free to carry on for another 10 minutes. Sure, fantastic. Here's another one. Uh, has Coursera developed any courses for learning more about COVID? Can you give some examples? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so yes, we have. So we had one course with uh, Imperial College. That was the very first one. The Another one, uh, which is really, really close to my heart and is really relevant for this particular panel, uh, it's uh, the John Hopkins University course on COVID traceability. So that particular course is uh, helping to, it, 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 it's interesting, but it's saving lives, honestly. I mean, when we talk about, uh, when, when we thought about, uh, about uh, online learning, we thought, uh, you know, online learning can help you to get a better job, to get better opportunities and so on. But we never thought that a, an online course will help uh, saving lives, and this is what is happening in right now. So about a month, about a month, uh, month and uh, and two weeks ago, uh, J uh, John Hopkins University launched this course on COVID traceability that is completely for free and is helping governments to basically to train um, health workers and, and also like providing jobs to non-health workers on COVID traceability. And in, uh, in uh, last time that I checked was uh, last week, we had like 600,000 people already took this course. And the reason because this course is really close to my heart is um, I was sharing this story in, um, in another webinar in, um, in Latin America. And uh, the Colombian government learned about this course and they approach us after that and say, Mario, uh, we really need this course because COVID traceability is extremely important and can help us to save lives. So the president itself, Ivan Duque, he commissioned a uh, part of his team to translate that course into Spanish because most of this course, most of the health workers didn't speak English. So in less than four days, they uh, translated the course and we made it accessible uh, to everyone on the Hispanic market. And right now, uh, actually four days ago, we launched completely the, the, the same course, uh, completely in Spanish and completely in Portuguese, uh, and that's totally for free. So uh, the COVID traceability course of, uh, by JSU is, uh, is, 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 is available right now and, um, and it's saving lives. Great, Mario, thank you. Um, another question for you. Uh, what is the main demographic that is taking uh, Coursera courses. Are there lifelong learners or older students as well as undergraduates? That's interesting. I would say, um, so in Latin America, the, um, the largest percentage of uh, learners, uh, of Coursera learners are from 21 to 38 years old. Um, and basically, when we start reaching out to these learners, uh, our learners who either are at their first job or second job, and some of them also like had experience of like living abroad uh, outside of Latin America and coming back. So they also like uh, they are some of them are bilingual. Um, so uh, that's kind of like that's uh, that, that's the main uh, that's the main uh, 
chunk of, uh, of learners in terms of like paid enrollments. But then also we can see also a huge spread um, in, um, in, uh, in other ages um, that uh, are particularly coming from other course, other regions. So in Mexico, again, we only, in Mexico, we only have like, we have 3.6 million learners and they come from all different backgrounds. And we recently run a survey in Mexico where we discovered that uh, 56% of our learners were women and 44% uh, were men, and uh, which is really great because I'm a feminist too, and I really believe in women empowerment. So uh, lots of women are taking courses in Mexico, and uh, a lot of them are taking really, really, really hard courses in computer science and data science. So I believe this is creating a big impact. In terms of the second part of the question, which is uh, lifelong learning, uh, this is something that uh, we are promoting, and I believe uh, with a times higher education is also a big promoter of a long life learner. Uh, basically, this is a message that I really encourage uh, all the audience and all of us just kind of like to keep um, spreading this message of lifelong learning. It's uh, it's not a, it's it, it's not a, um, it's not a nice to have. It's a must to have, especially these days. Uh, so yeah, we're a big promoters of uh, lifelong learning, and Coursera is a great. Um, the companies that are using Coursera uh, it are basically big promoters of that as well. Thank you. Fantastic, Mario. Um, there's another uh, question uh, that I can take. Uh, will universities ever fully return to face-to-face -face learning or is blended learning now the new normal? Uh, what we've seen uh, through the region and in other parts of the world is that um, uncertainty is the norm right now. So most of the schools in Latin America are not fully returning in 2020. So they are really preparing themselves for a blended learning uh, model. Uh, every week we talk to uh, probably 10 or 15 universities and every single one of them want to include uh, blended learning uh, in a way or another. Uh, even universities that are really, you know, like uh, uh, classic, uh, old fashioned universities uh, with uh, great uh, on-campus teaching methods uh, are now moving to a blended uh, learning model. Even if it's just a, a small percentage of their programs, but they are really realizing that um, using content from their own faculty or from you know third parties is becoming not just a quicker way to scale their programs, but it's also a way um, to offer additional skills to these students. And I think this is key, you know, uh, it's difficult for a single university to have the infrastructure, the faculty, the content for every uh, knowledge domain. So it's much interesting to offer additional content from reputed universities or from reputed sources to these students so they can complement their programs. And this is what we've seen so far in, in Latin America, and as I mentioned, in other parts of the world. Um, the uh, Universidad Nacional that I mentioned is a very good example. It's a university with a lot of research that is conducting every day, but they learn quickly that they can uh, make a better use of their resources if they let others take over some basic courses or even intermediate or advanced courses. So yeah, to the question, blended learning is becoming slowly the new norm. Some universities with more experience than others, but we're seeing um, an appetite for blended learning uh, all over the place. Mario, another question for you. Um, can you explain how Coursera supports assessments? Sure. So we have, um, in terms of assessments, we have uh, with the synchronicus and the asynchronicus model. So on the asynchronous model, you have um, well tests, uh, the assessments that have been already created by the professor that are reflected on our MOOCs and specializations also. And um, we also have projects that are, have, uh, so that that's basically uh, the professor set up the exam and the assessments basically um, 
it's uh, it, 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 it's responded by by kind of like yes, no's, and particular different answers. The second one is a peer assessment. So we have a, a peer assessment model where the Coursera community helped each other to uh, to to grade um, tests and projects. So for instance, every course has a final project, and I just finished uh, the last one, which was on um, on. On actually on 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 sales and uh, my finance project was to sell something to a stranger and I also have to create a presentation so I have to shoot a video of myself like trying to sell something to a stranger in the street and also uh, I have to create a whole deck and a presentation um, explaining that project and that was reviewed by a peer who was also like doing the same course uh, that I uh, and and that per person was a uh, giving me like different grades uh based on on my on my projects um so that's also that's part of it and the third one is that we we built this uh honor code and the honor code is basically is uh every learner have to sign up this uh honor code where they kind of like commit that basically they are um they're going to take the exams and everything by themselves. Uh, finally, we're also like creating another solution. So kind of like biometrics and other technical solutions to, uh, to help um, learners to, uh, with, with, uh, with the assessments. Uh, but there are a lot of like uh, different, like very creative assessments. So uh, one course of robotics, for instance, by UNAM, uh, the learner had to create, a, to build a robot and uh, to build a robot to do one particular uh, function and just to build, uh, to record the video out of it and finally on terms of like degrees uh, that's a different um, that's definitely like a different uh, type of assessments some of the assessments uh, before COVID were taken uh, on class other ones were taken through through uh, other platforms such as ProctorU or others great we have three minutes left maybe we can take one more question uh, there is a question from Alistair Lawrence can Coursera's authoring tools help create curricula that utilize, utilize, utilize LATAM's unique research base to attract more international students and compete with the UK, US, and other regions, um, for sure. Uh, and I have a very good example. We are right now discussing with a university in Latin America, uh, which has a very unique research base on uh, tropical disease, uh, tropical crops, and they made uh, lots of advancement in um, how to best use land in tropical, um, in the tropical belt. So this kind of research is pretty interesting to be included in their own curriculum with Coursera's authoring tools. So yes, definitely the answer is yes, because it's not only, Coursera is not only meant to be used as a, a content repository, but also as a way of creating new content to offer to uh, uh, their private uh, community. So this is an interesting question and the answer is yes. Uh, Mario, yep. one, I'll one add the, uh, go ahead. I will, add, I will add one thing. So three universities in Latin America, Tecnológico Monterrey, Católica, Chile, and Universidad de Los Andes, they got together and created this project called La Triada, where on Coursera for Campus, they shared the knowledge from like these three universities. That was the very first collaboration that happened two years ago, and the only collaboration between three universities uh, under this particular uh, platform. And they created also this specialization called Doing Business in Latin America that is currently available. And uh, it's definitely like it's off the charts. So uh, the provost of uh, this university told us, uh, Pablo, the former provost, Pablo Navas, told us, you know what's the best disruption, next disruption in education is? And we say like, no. Nope. And he said it's collaboration. So that was the collaboration between three universities that happened in Latin America and it's shining around the world. Perfect. Uh, Mario, our time is up, but uh, thank you very much to the organizer of this event for having us here. Um, you already have our emails and the way to contact us. So let us know if you have any more questions or if uh, we as Coursera can help your university, your uh, institution in any way during this COVID-19 or beyond. So thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you very much. And thank you to our speakers from Coursera, Mario and Francisco for a very interesting session on continuing education and blended learning. Uh, thank you to you both.